subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the daily edition of the Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 13th of September 2022 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 15, that is the international relation page. The article is important from the perspective of UPSC as in the examination of the mains, UPSC has asked question with respect to the constitutional schemes of the other country. For example, in previous year question, in 2021, they have asked with respect to the USA constitution. In 2019, they have asked with respect to the French constitution. And again, they had the reputation in 2018 with respect to the US. And that is the reason why we are going to discuss the Britain constitutional scheme and we'll try to analyze this with respect to Indian constitutional scheme. Recently, after the death of Queen Elizabeth in Britain, her son Charles has taken the seat of British monarch. And after taking the place of monarch, he has addressed the British parliament for the first time since coming to the position. As far as labor's mapping is concerned, so this topic is important under General Studies Paper 2, in which all the previous three questions were asked. And under this, the UPSC has explicitly mentioned to compare the Indian constitution scheme with that of the other countries. So whenever we read about the con constitution of other country, do remember that there are five, six important countries which you should always compare Indian constitution with. Top of all would be the US, UK, France, Japan, Chinese constitution and the Russian constitution. The content for today's discussion would include the similarities which India has with respect to the British constitution and the differences that are there with respect to both these constitutions. So let's start with the similarities first and try to compare them. After the entire discussion, you will be in a position to answer this question with ease and also answer this prelim related question for your practice. So let's start with the similarities first. The first similarity between both the constitution is that the government which they are running are running under the parliamentary scheme. Parliamentary scheme simply means that there is an organization known by the term parliament in which the executive is responsible to the legislation. And here executive means the cabinet or the council of minister and the council of ministers who are actually coming from the legislation are responsible towards the legislation itself. Now how it happens? The legislation is the directly responsible towards the people of the country, whether it is UK or whether it is India. So when they are directly responsible to the people of the country, the functioning of the cabinet or the council of ministers should be responsible to the legislation. So whenever the member of parliament asks a particular question to the cabinet, they should be in a position to answer it. The second one is the majority party rule, which simply proves that 50% plus one should be the ideal criteria of defining the majority. So a political party which wins the majority votes in the general election will be the ruling party in the government. So the parliamentary form of government with the majority party rule means that here the head of this government is the prime minister. So whether you talk about the Britain or you talk about India, in both the areas we will find that the executive, the real executive is actually the prime minister. The third difference is that they are enjoying the limited government and rule of law. In both the constitutional scheme, the rule of law is the top priority. The constitution does not give any organization or any institution the power to overrule the law of the land. The government is limited. The functioning of executive can be limited by legislation or judiciary. The functioning of judiciary is being checked by the executive and the legislation and even the legislation can be denied the absolute power in the functioning of their governance. So the different pillars 
of the democracy are being checked and balanced by the limited government clause of the constitutional scheme. The next one is the real and the nominal executive. Now, in India, we have the real executive as prime minister and the nominal executive as president. In UK, we have the real executive as prime minister, while as it is a monarchical setup of government, we have the monarch or queen or the king or queen. So both way we have the real and the nominal executive. Now real executive means the person who actually execute the executive powers. Nominal means the person who is a nominal head. He or she has no absolute power in the functioning of the government. The fifth one is the cabinet form of government. Under the cabinet form of government, a bunch of people who are part of the cabinet holds the important portfolios. These portfolios are nothing but different ministries and they have a substantial share of power projection in the government. For example, the law minister, the defense minister, finance minister. So they are known as the cabinet and they are very important ministers. And the entire cabinet, which derives its power from the council of minister, is responsible to the legislation that is the core feature of the parliamentary system and they are collectively responsible so it is not that the home minister or the prime minister is only responsible to the government or the legislation it is the entire system of the cabinet or the council of minister who is responsible so they enjoy the collective responsibility and that is the reason all ministers sink and swim together so when they are in the government, they are swimming together. And when the government falls, they sink together. As far as prime minister is concerned, so yes, his appointment, because prime minister is not appointed from the outside body, it is appointed by the nominal executive. His leadership, his removal functions are more or less similar in both the constitutional schemes. India and UK have the bicameral legislation. So in UK, they have House of Commons and House of Lords. In India, we have Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. There's an independence of judiciary in both the government. The last common feature, important feature is the election. In both the government, we have that there is a first past the post system in which the direct elections are held and the majority vote gaining candidate who's contesting in the election wins the election. Both of them are not following the proportional representation for the direct elections to their legislative bodies. As you must have been aware that the Government of India Act 1935 is the major crux or the foundation of Indian polity from the perspective of constitutional development. So Government of India Act 1935 which was passed by the British Parliament back then when India was under the colonial rule laid down the foundation of the constitutional scheme in India and based on the same the elections were held and the constituent assembly was created. Most of the features of this act was actually borrowed by the Indian constituent assembly for the framing of Indian constitution. Now with this let us talk about the basic differences because this is very important. This is where the UPSC can frame a question. The first is the nature. So how is the nature of the constitution? The British constitution is unwritten constitution. Everything which is ever created by the British parliament is part of the constitution. So if they create, let's say, 100 laws this year, all laws will be part of their constitution. On the other hand, Indian constitution is a written constitution. It is the lengthiest constitution. And being a written constitution, it is also the limited constitution. So it's not that every law which is being created by the parliament will be will find a place in the constitution. It's not like that. The second difference is the amendability. British constitution is flexible, can be amended by 50% of the member present and voting. However, in case of India, under Article 368, the constitution amendability is a very rigid process. It requires special voting. It requires special session and the process is also very cumbersome. 
However, it is flexible because as per the Keshwan and Bharti case, the entire constitution can be amended until and unless it breaches the basic structure. Coming on the directive principle of state policies and the fundamental duties, they are completely absent under the British and they are present in India. The origin is actually different. India created its constitution from the help of constituent assembly created in 1946. On the other hand, the British constitution is not under the constituent assembly. It's an evolutionary development. It evolved through the process over centuries. On the question of federalism, the British parliament or the British constitution is working under a unitary system. So there is no difference between the unit and the central power. While in India, it is a quasi-federal, there are certain features in which the only supreme or the central power functions. There are other features where only the state functions. For example, agriculture is a topic where which is found under the state list and state governments are more empowered. On the other hand, uh, topics like currency, Indian defense forces are under the union list. So over there, the union enjoy the power. So that is the reason why Indian model is a quasi-federal model. Both center and the state have distributed power. In terms of nature of the state, British is a complete and the best example of constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy means the head of the state is the monarch, the king or the queen. But this king or the queen is a nominal head and they enjoy absolutely no discretionary power. And that is the reason why they are known as golden zero because their contribution to the framing of the constitution or their contribution in the governance model is completely zero. On the other hand, India is a republic because head of the state that is president is elected person. And as he or she is elected person, they enjoy some discretionary power. For example, when there is no party in the majority in the parliament, president can take the decision to appoint the prime minister based on certain conditions. The other differences include the form of parliament. The British parliament is the only legislative body in the country and it has two different houses that is it is a bicameral. On the other hand, in India, the judicial review and its basic structure proves that parliament is not completely sovereign. Instead, it is the people of India who are sovereign. So parliament in India is not enjoying absolute power. When we come to the executive, it consists the king, the prime minister and his council of minister who are along with the permanent executive and civil servant privy council. On the other hand, the executive in India includes the prime minister, president, ministers and bureaucrats. Office of prime minister will always be from the lower house. In India, it can be from the either house. So a prime minister from India can be from Rajya Sabha also and he can be from the Lok Sabha also. The best example is the recent or the ex prime minister Manmohan Singh who was from Rajya Sabha. And the last difference is on terms of judiciary. Judiciary in Britain do enjoy some limited power to declare a law ultra wise, but they cannot strike down a particular act. For example, in India, with respect to the National Judicial Appointment Commission, this was created by the parliament and it was completely struck down by the Indian judiciary based on the judicial review. So in terms of judiciary, yes, the judiciary of Britain, British system is based on limited judicial independence. On the other hand, the independence or the judicial independence in India is mostly derived from that of the US model. Because in US model, judiciary is extremely powerful in order to control and keep the government limited in its governance. With this discussion in place, now let us come to this question. Enumerate various similarities and common elements which are shared between the Indian and the Britain constitution. Now you have ample points. You have to write this answer along with the introduction and the conclusion in 250 words. Do write this answer for better practice. And as far as prelims is concerned, so this is your practice question. This would be your question number one. Do solve this question and do comment in the comment box. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 09. 
and it is part of the editorials. The article actually focuses on how India can project itself and how India should deal with the next year's G20 meet. The context says that India is going to host the next year's G20 or Group of 20 meet for the first time in its history. India is a founding member of G20 and being a founding member, this time India is going to host the meeting and in 2022 means as well as 2023 means examination for general studies paper 2 under international relation g20 could possibly be one of the most important topic for you to prepare as far as labor mapping is concerned so under general studies paper 2 it is important for your bilateral regional and global groupings so g20 is part of a global grouping the second heading under which this could be asked is the important international institutions. So here also the G20 and its various agencies could be asked. Today's discussion will be around the concept of G20, historical relevance, how it came into existence. Do we really need G20? What are the challenges that we face under the functioning of G20? What should India do? in the upcoming G20, that is the 2023, when India is going to be the host and what India should avoid as a host in G20 next year's meet. Now beyond G20, this month of September is going to be busy for India. The G20 this year, that is 2022, is going to be held at Bali and Bali means Indonesia. Apart from G20, Prime Minister is also going to be part of the Shanghai Corporation Organization in which he is likely to meet the Chinese Premier Xi Jinping to discuss the outline issues of Ladakh. Now both the countries have recently gained the substantial disengagement and they have removed their defense forces from the important strategic places. Apart from that, India is also going to be part of India-Japan 2 plus 2 dialogue in which both the countries will be represented by the foreign minister and the defense minister to talk on the strategic issues. So the month of September is going to be the busiest month as far as Indian diplomacy is concerned. So India should be well prepared to be the host for G20 in the next year. Now let's talk about what G20 is all about. Through this entire flowchart, we'll be able to understand both the prelims as well as the main pointer and the relevance of G20 in the global geopolitics. Now, G20, first of all, is an international intergovernmental group. It is an intergovernmental. So do remember that it is represented by the governments and not the private entities or the NGOs. It is an informal group, so there is no treaty, there is no agreement between these member countries or the partner nations to come and form a group. Under this group, there are 19 nations from both developing as well as developed sphere and they also include the European Union. So technically saying it has more than 20 countries, so do remember that. Never confuse between G20 as a group and the number of countries. The main focus of G20 remains on the global economy and the reason being simple that it was founded under the context of or the under the objective to protect the global economy from frequent economic meltdown or frequent financial crisis. So protecting the global economy and stabilizing the financial sector remains the topmost priority. It also talks about the climate change and the mitigation step that should be taken, but it is not a body like the IPCC or the United Nations Framework on Climate Change. They are the core authorities to work in the climate change mitigation. The last important objective is the sustainable development across the member nations. As far as historical perspective is concerned, so after forming as an intergovernmental group, it was based on the 1997-99 Asian financial crisis. Under this financial crisis, many Southeast Asian nations were under the huge burden of financial issues. 
So the finance ministers from these member countries and the central bank governors, they met in 1999 and formally gave the shape of an informal group of G20. However, the same was repeated in 2008. So nine years down the line, there was a financial crisis or the subprime crisis that world faced in 2008. Fearing the same, the finance ministers and the central bank governors, this time along with the head of states, decided to conduct an annual meeting of G20 member countries to discuss their main focus agenda. Now, the relevance of G20 is very high. The member countries contribute 80% to the world GDP, despite having just 60% of the population. It means the member countries which are part under the G20 are rich countries, except few developing nations. They contribute almost 75% of the world trade and four important partners that is India, China, US and European Union together forms more than 40% of the trade. The working of the G20 focuses on two different tracks. The first one is the finance track in which it focuses on the monetary fiscal issues across the world and the financial regulation. For example, it talks about bringing the smooth financial transactions between the different economies. Under the Sherpa track, it focuses on the border issues, the political engagement, anti-corruption issues, development, energy, energy issues and others. So you can understand that the G20 has two focuses, the one which is entirely the financial focus on which the G20 was actually founded. The second one is the non-financial issues that have been added post-2008. So this is how the entire structure and the functioning of the G20 looks like. Now, as you can see from this map, all the shaded red color countries are part of G20. So from this map itself, it is seen that it holds a substantial position in geopolitics. Unfortunately, certain countries of that is the Western part of South America and the majority of almost 90% of Africa is absent in the G20 framework. Along with this, the Central Asian countries are also absent in this grouping. Now, why India need G20? The first one is that India wants to discuss the major international issues such as the climate change, terrorism and others. And India require a platform where India can discuss these issues without a problem. India through G20 can bring various partners. So partner in Asia, partner in Africa, partner in America and even EU under the one roof. And when India finds different partners in its bilateral relationship, India can discuss single topics simultaneously and various topics at a single point. Indian leaders can meet the other important leaders, let's say from US, Russia, China and others and discuss their even the bilateral issues. So as we have said that India can discuss the border issue with China, India can discuss the trade issues with Russia, India can discuss the IPR issue with US. India can put its own agenda and vision on geopolitics. For example, India is looking to free and fair trade in world trade organization. Or India is also looking towards the open Indo-Pacific region. India can also enhance its global value and multilateral participation. So the more India engages with these top countries, the top powerful countries in the world, the more India can enhance its global value. So it will create more groupings. For example, the recent one is the Quad grouping, where the partner countries of G20 have come together to form a important strategic alliance. And G20 can help India to meet its foreign aspiration. India is looking for UNSC permanent seat. India is looking towards the World Trade Organization reforms. So in these aspirations, India can get more participation, more agreement and more support from the G20 members. Now, the point is there are multiple issues faced by the G20. The first one is that it is dominated by the developed nation, US and European nations. It has non-conclusive discussions. So whenever the partners or the member nations, they meet together, they do not come to any conclusive decision. Most of the discussion remain on paper. There are statements, speeches, 
but the substantial agreement or solution to international issues are not there. There is no charter, no treaty, no formal structure of this organization. It does not even have a proper headquarter. The partner countries are having contrasting view. Imagine this. So there is US versus Russia. Then we have India versus China. So the member countries have very high bilateral issues themselves. They have the limited objective. So they do not bring major or even sometimes minor issues into their discussion. It is a very likely chance that this year's Bali conference of G20 might not discuss the Ukraine-Russia issue because both US and Russia are going to be there. There's a lack of coordination among the partner nations because they are anti to each other. And there has remained a limited success on the economic front also. Despite going through the 1999 crisis, after the repetition of 2008 crisis, the recent economic crisis due to COVID-19 saw that the member countries of the G20 were not in synchronization to control the issues of global economy. Now, what should India do next year? The first one is that India should always bring climate change to the forefront. Now, what we have seen recently is that there have been a frequency of urban floods in India. The recent example one is from the Bengaluru. We have also seen that there have been a flood in Pakistan. So flood droughts have been the consequences of climate change and India should take a lead in this regard. The next one is that India should raise the limited approach on UNSC reforms. Now, India has been subjected to the restrictions imposed by China on the UNSC reform. So India can utilize the G20 platform next year to pressurize the G20 members to bring reforms in the UNSC and increase the number of permanent members. India can also raise the cross-border terrorism with special emphasis on Pakistan. India can also raise voice for the open and secure nuclear material trade but under the international law. India should always raise the Indo-Pacific issue and should call for open and secure trade on the sea lanes of communication. India can also raise the issue of patent and IPR waiver that India should enjoy along with other developing countries so that India can provide the COVID vaccine and can share the transfer of technology with the developed nations. India should have the sustainable energy transition. So focusing on sustainable energy transition simply means more emphasis given to the International Solar Alliance and renewable energy sources. India can also stand for the collective defense of smaller countries, for example, the Ukraine. Going by the WTO reforms, more market access and subsidy on agriculture should be raised. And lastly, India should utilize the platform for bringing the developing nations more participation in the international organizations such as the UNSC, such as IMF or even the World Trade Organization. Now, what India should avoid in the next G20 meet? The first one is India should not bring the Chinese aggression because it is a bilateral issue and should be resolved between India and China. If India try to bring that issue on the G20 platform, it might bring criticism as well as the grouping division on the particular issue. India should not bring the Ukraine-Russia conflict on the forefront or even the Europe-related issue and the issue between the Europe participation in the Russian-Ukraine war. India should not compare the Quad with SCO because India is member to both and the objective of both the organizations are different. One is dominated by Russia and China, the other one is dominated by US. And lastly, India should not compare the Eastern and Western Hemisphere because the members in G20 are divided into both groupings. With this discussion place, now I'm going to leave you with this mains related practice question. Group of 20 has become more a formal meet rather a platform to solve the global issues that we have already highlighted with respect to the limitations of G20. In this regard, you should discuss the issue also highlight the role India should play in the upcoming G20 meet of 2023. 
try to answer this question in 250 words and after that you can also solve this practice question this is your question number two so read this carefully and try to answer in the comment box let us now move to the next article for the day this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 12 and talks about the supreme court's collegium which has recommended eight names for the appointment as judges in bombay high court and this collegium is led by as you know headed by the chief justice of india u u lalit now from the perspective of upsc examination the collegium system is not only important in the prelim examination it is also important under the general studies paper 2 in which upsc can ask question with respect to the structure organization and the functioning of judiciary and collegium is an important part of the functioning and structure of judicial system so today we are going to talk about the important constitutional articles with reference to the supreme court as well as the collegium system we will look into the history of collegium system how it has evolved as well as what are the basic tenets and lastly we will try to analyze the functioning of collegium system do india need such kind of system or not through the merits and the demerits after the entire discussion, you will be in a position to answer this prelims related question and also able to understand how the entire collegium functions. Before that, do remember that collegium system is common for high court and supreme court together. There is no collegium system separate for the high courts or for the lower judiciary. The lower judiciary appointments are not based on the collegium system headed by the Chief Justice of India. So let's start the discussion. These are the important articles which are given in the Indian constitution and are associated with the appointment of the Supreme Court judges. Well, Article 124.2 says that every judge of a Supreme Court shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal. Article 124.2a, which is a sub part of the above article, says that a judge may by writing under his hand addressed to the president resign his office so the resignation letter should go to the president directly without any executive or the judicial interference when it comes to the article 124 4 it talks about the removal it says that a judge of a supreme court shall not be removed from his or her office except by the order of the president so here also the role of the president is very important. But this order is not subjected to the personal will of a president. This order should be passed by both the houses of the parliament supported by majority of the total membership of that house and by the majority of not less than two thirds of the members of that house present in voting. So if you are reading about the Indian polity through M. Lakshmikant book, you must have gone through different kinds of majorities which are required to pass a particular resolution. In this case, in order to pass an order through the president, parliament have to come together. At each house of the parliament, it is not a matter of joint sitting, each house should pass this separately with the majority which means 50% of the strength plus one along with not less than two third of the members who are present and voting. So this is very important thing which you need to remember for your prelims examination. This majority then will help to pass an order which order will go to a particular judge through the president and that judge will be liable to leave the position. Article 124.6 talks about oath and affirmation of a particular judge in a Supreme Court. It says that a person who is appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court will take an oath and affirmation before the president or any other person who is appointed by the president and we know that these oath and affirmations are given in the third schedule of Indian Constitution. So irrespective of how a person is appointed, resignation, removal or even the oath, everywhere you will find the mention of a single person who is the president of India. But as we know, the executive power, the real executive power of the president lies with the council of minister headed by the prime minister. So in this case also, will, ideas, 
advise everything comes from the council of minister headed by the prime minister president is acting as an implementing authority in this case also and lastly we have article 124/7 which puts restrictions on the practice by a particular judge after the retirement this article says that a person who has already hold an office of judge in the supreme court will not be allowed to plead or act in any court or even before any authority within the territory of india are you getting this point see this article has actually provided an ample space for a person to act or plead in the international level they are restricted at the national but they are not restricted at the international level now i want this from you who was the person who was appointed as a judge at the international level after being a judge in the indian supreme court if you know the answer please comment in the comment box now we come to the point that what is a collegium i believe all of you must have read it previously if not then go through this discussion in a much detail well collegium system is one where the cji and a forum of four senior most judges well this can differ from country to country and it is not important that every country should have a collegium however it is important for india so this system has now 1 plus 4 judges of the supreme court who recommend appointment and transfer see both appointment and transfer are part of the collegium activity of the higher judiciary now what do we have learned from this definition the first one that there are five member the second one all of them are from supreme court the third one that they only recommend they do not take the final decision the fourth one that they are looking for appointment as well as transfer for the judges and the fifth one that they are looking for higher judiciary only which means they can take decisions on high court as well as supreme court so we do not have a collegium system at the high court level so this is what we have learned so far now how collegium system came into existence well it is based on the three important supreme court judgments which were made previously and they are known as judges cases they are three in number in first case the supreme court has clearly said that opinion of the chief justice of india and the chief justice of the respective high courts were merely consultative it means they are not final and the power of appointment resides solely and exclusively with the central government well in simple terms it means that this case has proved that supreme court is not the final authority to decide on the appointments and give enormous power to the central government to override the opinion given by the cgi however under second judge's case supreme court gave a different judgment well this case is famously known as supreme court advocates on record association versus union of india 1993 under this case supreme court has clearly emphasized that government does not enjoy primacy or absolute discretion in the matter of appointment of supreme court judges hence what they should do they should look for participatory consultative process and said that the power of the executive should be just to go for providing checks and balances and not practice in absolute terms well it simply means that the absolute power which was given to the executive under the first judge's case was now denied however still there was a set of confusion that how this consultation should be made possible what should be the ideal criteria what should be the procedure to go for collegium type of system well this problem came to an end under third judge's case which is also an important precedence when it comes to the presidential reference to the supreme court well under article 143 of the indian constitution president can refer a particular matter for the advisory jurisdiction of the supreme court and because of this reference today we are having the collegium system so as per this case and the judgment chief justice of india shall consult four senior most judges of the supreme court now we come to that number of 1+4 and this 1 plus 4 grouping is actually the current status of the collegium we know that national judicial appointment commission was created in order to replace the collegium system however this was struck down by the supreme court saying that it goes against the independence of the judiciary and balance of power however under this case supreme court had a opinion 
that all the member of the collegium regarding their recommendation shall put it in the writing. It means that whatever they recommend for the appointment of a particular judge should be given in a writing form. It should not be oral. Secondly, they should follow the majority rule. Now, what does it mean? It means that if the majority of the collegium is against the appointment of a particular person, let's say three out of five members say that a particular person is not eligible to be a judge in the Supreme Court, then that person will cease to be a member in the Supreme Court. However, we have an exemption in this. A High Court judge of outstanding merit can be appointed as a Supreme Court judge regardless of his standing in the seniority list. See, the most important issue regarding the collegium system is what amounts to meritorious eligibility. And the second important list is how to come up with an important, non-partial and ethical seniority list. If these two issues are resolved, collegium system can become more accurate and trustworthy. Now given the evolution of the collegium system in India, now let us also look into what are the pros and cons of the collegium system in India. The first important merit of the collegium system is that it ensures the independence of the judiciary because under this system, the executive control or the executive initiative comes only at the later stage or at the last stage of the appointment. So president is not consulted while going through the merits of a particular candidate. Prime Minister or the Council of Ministers are not at all involved while listing down the important members to be appointed to the Supreme Court. Hence, it ensures the independence of the judiciary as mentioned under Article 50. As we have discussed previously, the recommendations and the views are taken in the writing format. So a person cannot deny that he or she has recommended or not recommended to a particular person in the future. So the possibility of denial in the course of appointment is ruled out. The prevalence of the majority opinion also favors that it is based on a democratic process. If most more number of college members are against a particular person, he or she ceases to be appointed to a judge in the Supreme Court. Reservation given by even two members or the two judges in the collegium system is also taken very seriously. It means that if two members in the collegium says that a particular person is not eligible or is less eligible than the other candidate, that person is also ceased to be a member in the Supreme Court. And lastly, it allows talented lawyers from the Bar Association to be appointed as a judge. Well, this is something which is very good. It actually removes the issue of uncle judges, where the member of the judiciary who know each other favors each other. So we have that kind of issue in the lower judiciary, but appointment of the lawyers to the Supreme Court and the High Court has reduced this issue of uncle judges to a considerable level. Now let us come into the demerits of the collegium system. The first one is the lack of transparency and accountability. As we have discussed previously, because of the ambiguity in what amounts to the seniority level and what amounts to the merit of a particular person, there lies a element of lack of transparency and accountability. Despite giving the recommendation in the written format, a particular member of a collegium is not accountable to why and how they have appointed a particular person or recommended a particular person. There is no authority in India that can question that why a particular judge was appointed as a Supreme Court judge. Secondly, we have lack of consensus among the members of the collegium. The point is, Let's say there are four members who are saying that a particular person is eligible. However, Chief Justice of India is not finding it to be eligible. There might also be a case where one person knows the background of the eligible candidate to be in the dark format. However, the other judges, that is three or maybe even the Supreme Court Chief Justice say that a person is eligible. What is the solution to this kind of problem? It is yet to be answered. There have been some allegations regarding the nepotism practice in the Supreme Court which says that number of judges who have been appointed had one or the other linkages with the past political parties or the current political parties, which actually brings down the quality of judgment in the future. We also have politicization of the judiciary, where the judges who have been appointed by the collegium, or in fact, the members of the collegium have been given political patronage in the future. We also have absence of permanent commission. Law commission under its recommendation of 121st report has proposed to set up a national judicial service commission to appoint judges. 
In fact, National Commission for the Review of Working of the Indian Constitution in 2002 report has also highlighted the need for National Judicial Commission for the purpose of appointing to the for the purpose of appointing members to the higher judiciary. But both these recommendations were sidelined. Judiciary earlier has also declared NGAC Act, that is National Judicial Appointment Commission Act, and its particular constitutional amendment as unconstitutional. Many political scientists have called this as a overreach by the judiciary who were not open to go for compromising situation and balance of power. Because declaring NGAC as unconstitutional has also raised fingers on the working of the judiciary which is supporting a mechanism where judges are appointed by the judges without any role of the executive and in fact the legislation. Now given this discussion and the analysis of the NGAC, we also come to the conclusion with this important prelims question. So read this question carefully and answer in the comment box. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 16 that is the business page and talks about that India needs another 28 gigawatts to be produced using the new coal-fired plant by the year 2032. Now the entire globe is talking about non-fossil fuels or the renewable form of energy. India itself has set a gigantic task of achieving 450 gigawatts of power from the renewables. India is also producing one of the largest power as far as solar is concerned along with the international efforts such as International Solar Alliance. However, the Central Electricity Authority has highlighted that India still requires the additional 25 gigawatt to be produced from the coal-fired plants. Now, why do we need such kind of expectation? The reason is that the demand which India is having is more than the supply. And setting up of renewable power plants at a specific area is very limited. So you can set up the renewable power plants such as solar in Rajasthan, Gujarat or southern state. But setting up a large solar power plant in let's say Himachal Pradesh or Uttarakhand is very limited. Even if we set up the decentralized power plants such as the geothermal power plants in Uttarakhand, that will have limited access. So more or less, we cannot deny the fact that coal-fired plants is here to stay. The syllabus mapping for this topic would be that it can be asked under the geographical areas of coal and coal-related industry in your general studies paper 1. And the same can be asked with respect to different perspective under the coal power of infrastructure or the coal power related pollution under the environmental issues in GS paper 3. The article has observed that the annual power demand in India is increasing at 7.2%. However, the supply is not. So over-reliance on the renewable energy can reduce the supply of the power. Hence, the need of the hour is to actually to not give up the coal-fired plant and its energy as of now. On the other hand, government is also looking to diversify. And because of that, in the future, the coal demand for the power generation is going to fall below 50%. So today's discussion will be focusing on what is the basic status of coal power in India, the issues which are faced under the coal power plant, the concerns with respect to the power generated from coal, including the environmental concern, health concern and others, and possible way forward for now. As far as status is concerned, so as of February 2022, that is this year, 51.5% of the total power generation in India came from the coal directly, which is a very high number. So more than half of India's power is coming from the coal. According to 2021 India Energy Outlook, India has doubled its demand in the energy sector since year 2000. So in the last 20 years, India has doubled the demand. And according to the International Energy Agency's coal report, India will increase its annual demand of coal power by 4% in the coming years. So all these three proves that coal is here to stay. Coal demand is increasing. The power demand is increasing. And coal is going to meet that demand even in the future as well. If we go by the international comparison, we'll find that by the year 2035, 
India will be on the third position, producing the 9% of the global power. As far as tariffs are concerned on the renewable energy. Now, why we say renewable is finding the alternative. Now, as you can see from the table above, the renewable energy, the cost per unit of renewable energy has been as low as 1.75 rupee per unit, which is far below that of the coal. So the coal power generation is around 4 to 5 rupee per unit. And that is the reason why coal is assumed to be not a clean fuel from the economic perspective. So this is the first issue. The second issue is that when it comes to the capital cost of renewable energy, let's say solar power plant or windmills. So the cost of setting up a solar power plant has reduced substantially over the last seven, eight years. And that has actually made the coal power plant less competitive in the market. So these two issues have been the major crux of replacing the coal power plant with that of the renewable sources of energy. The other reasons that we are going to discuss are as follows. As far as issue of coal is concerned, well, at mining stage, there are multiple issues. The first one being the geological hazard. Mining operation may remove the soil and the rock above the coal deposit. It might also lead to landslides, which may bury the poor labor employed in these fields. It may also lead to tectonic impact when explosives are used to blow up the mines. Dust and water runoff from these mines pollute and affect the area nearby. The release of methane gas from the underneath coal deposit can explode and can collapse the underground mines leading to the loss of life and precious deposits. As far as other impact is concerned, well, we have seen and the report has also commented that regional disparity is rising between the developed nations and the least developed nation. The disparity is with respect to the quality of coal. Now, developed country being rich can import high quality of coal which has low sulfur, low dust emission and low water vapors. That is the reason why despite importing high number of coal, their emission remains low. On the other hand, the least developed countries or low developed countries do not have much money. So they are relying on cheap coal which has high sulfur content and also high moisture content. This is the reason why these countries are showing more emission vis-a-vis -vis the amount of coal per unit utilization. There is limited transfer of technology that we have already seen. The reluctance of the developed nations to transfer good technology for low emission has been low. There has been a poor commitment with respect to the lower downing the coal thermal power plant since the signing of Paris deal in 2015. We also have instances of mine collapse and hazardous environmental impact. We have the damage to the nearby cropping pattern where the dust coming out of the coal power plant settle on the leaves that also impact the cropping pattern of the nearby areas. This is the reason why some of the areas which are situated closer to the coal power plant have seen the shifting in the cropping pattern. Most of the farmers are shifting from food crop to non-food crop in order to save their overall earnings. When we come to the power generation stage, coal has multiple issues there also. However, most of the issues are related to the emission of pollution by these power plant. The first one being the emission of sulfur dioxide, which may also cause the acid rain and respiratory illnesses. Then we have the nitrogen oxides, different oxides that contribute to the smoke and also the respiratory illness. Both of these is highly seen in areas like Delhi, where still some of the small coal power plants are functioning. We have particulate matter with respect to 2.5 pm, which contribute to smoke, haze and respiratory illnesses along with lung diseases. CO2 is also the other, another reason that is causing the greenhouse gas emission and warming up the entire environment. We have emission of heavy metals including the mercury that damages the human and other animals with respect to their neurological status. And lastly, we have the issue of fly ash and the bottom ash which is being released by the power plants. Now, the question is if so many problems are there with respect to the coal mining and coal generation and coal power generation through thermal means why do we still rely on coal energy? The first reason is that 
According to the BP Energy Outlook 2019, India is one of those nations which will reduce the coal demand, but this reduction will be very minor in the next 20 years. That is, India will fall from 56% to 48% only because the first reason is that there is high availability of coal, there is existing infrastructure, and the third point being that there are large PSUs and MNCs that have invested a lot of money that should be recovered by these power plant. The second major issue being the problem of land acquisition, funding problem and policy on the renewable energy especially with respect to the solar power plant across India. The third issue being that coal is not only produced for the energy purposes. Coal is also mined for steel industry, aluminium industry and even some of the small sectors which are using the coal power to produce other industrial output. Coal is also meeting the instantaneous peak load. We are going through the recent crisis of coal unavailability where most of the state government including the Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra are looking for bringing imported coal into their coal power plant. Why? Because in terms of instantaneous demand, when there is a sudden rise in the energy demand, coal is the easiest possible solution to bring energy in the nearest possible mean. However, when it comes to the renewable energy, it takes time to get installed and get into practice mode. Then we have clean coal technologies are being developed across the countries. But despite this, we cannot deny the fact that coal remains one of the most polluted means of energy production across the world. Should we move to the other means? Well, the answer should be yes. The way forward is that optimum energy mix in power generation should be adopted. So as of now, India should start looking to bring 50-50 percentage between the fossils and the non-fossil, gradually moving towards 2080 in the near future. Technologies like coal gasification, coal beneficiation, utilizing the coal bed methane, cleaning of the coal, removing the dust from the coal using different technologies should be adopted at the highest possible level. We also should move towards gradual phasing out of the high sulfur coal. If possible, India can substitute its own coal through export by importing the high quality coal that is anthracite from other nations. We should also move towards energy efficiency, including the energy efficiency with respect to the electronic devices, as well as energy efficiency with respect to the buildings. This will reduce the peak load demand in the country. And lastly, blending of power at the same station. For instance, if we have a coal power plant, let's say at a particular station, then this coal power plant should also be substituted at the same position with renewable energy plants. Like we can set up the coal energy as well as a renewable energy at the same position so that if once coal power plant stop providing because of the lack of availability or many other reasons, the renewable energy will start providing the energy to the nearby area. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 8th, that is the editorial page, and deals with the relevance of international law in India's diplomacy. Now, since India's independence, India has played an active role in international affairs and maintained the cordial relationship with different countries. India has played decisive and important role at various international forums. For example, the United Nations General Assembly, different multilateral forums such as G20 or even BRICS, and the recently founded Quad, India has played even the active role in shaping the international laws on terrorism, for example, the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. Along with this, India has also initiated many international organizations such as International Solar Alliance. Despite all these many successes in the field of international relations, India has not been able to realize the basic utilization of international law effectively for its own advantage. Thus, under this article, the author has suggested that India's ambition of punching above its weight in international affairs cannot be accomplished without its investing in international law. Now, before 
going into why India is not using that, we should know what India is actually doing. India is not utilizing the international law. Why? The first one is that India lack the right uses. For example, let's take the case of China. So under Chinese case, what we see that when China went through the transgression on India's sovereignty in Ladakh, India never used the international laws to raise fingers on China. India has always utilized the diplomatic channels for the resolution of an issue. Take another case, the case of Pakistan. Whenever Pakistan has been seen to violate the ceasefire agreement between India and Pakistan, India has not mentioned the international law or transgression for that matter. India has not used the international court even to hold Pakistan accountable for the breach of any international law. The second reason is the lack of use for its own benefit. Now, India has not been using the international law for its own benefit. For example, it has been resulted that India's failure to develop a new doctrine in the international law. Now, as India is not using the international law for its own benefit, India was not able to generate any international doctrine of its own. Except what we have seen in the case of CCIT or the recent International Solar Alliance. We do not see India to have its own international law, international initiative in this regard. Now, the question is why India is not utilizing the international laws for its own benefit. The first one is that the foreign services, the personals, the people who are working in the Indian foreign services are heavily populated with the journalists. For example, the Indian foreign service people or even the lower staff not very well equipped with the international laws. The legal treaty division under the Ministry of External Affairs is not functioning along with the international law. It is highly understaffed and lawyers practicing the international law find it more attractive to join the government as a journalist diplomat rather than the lawyers in the ministry itself. Then comes the issue of fragmentation of decision making. For example, on bilateral trade in crude oil and coal mining, Ministry of Trade and Commerce is involved along with the Ministry of Petroleum, Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Environment along with Ministry of External Affairs. So instead of bringing all the functioning under the one decision, the decision for international relations and international law is very much fragmented between different ministries in India. International law is one of the neglected discipline in India. Academically, international law has largely remained neglected in the last 75 years in the universities of India. There is lack of investment on the research and development for international law. So students do not find it easy to get the research and development on the international law and even the funding from the government and the private sector is very, very limited. Government is focusing more on the international relation rather than the international law. So if we go through the international law, we'll be in a position to resolve many of the issues such as IPR issues, the issues with respect to the patent. And diplomacy should be the secondary initiative. First initiative should be to practice and use the existing international law. Then India does not publishes any important journals which find place in the top journals at the international platform with respect to the international law. The international law academicians on their part, even they have failed to popularize the international law in Indian practices. And because of all these reasons, the utilization of international law in India has remained very, very limited. And most of the time, India actually focuses on the diplomatic channel instead of the international law to resolve the issues. So what India should do? The first is that in 2016, there was a committee which was created under the Department of International Law under Ministry of Law and Justice. And this committee has recommended to bring more utilization of international law rather than the international diplomatic channels to resolve the issues. The second one is the Parliamentary Committee of 2021 it has recommended the Ministry of External Affairs to establish chairs for research on international law in various universities. So India's ambition of punching above its weight in the international affairs cannot be accomplished without its investing in the international law.
With this discussion placed, now we have come to the end of today's daily news simplify. So I am going to leave you with the question of the day. The answer to yesterday's question of the day was option B. And today's question is on the right side. So read this question carefully and try to answer in the comment box. That's all for today's daily news simplify. Thank you.